Hey, good morning, every stats people out there in stats land. Today, we're going to actually start looking at the construction of a confidence interval. And today, we're going to construct the confidence interval for the proportion. Uh, so confidence interval for proportions, one of the major skills here in AP Calculus. So let's get started. So this is actually one of the days that, uh, I don't know, students usually look forward to. It's Hershey Kiss Day. And when you toss a Hershey Kiss, it sometimes lands flat and sometimes lands on its side. So the question is, what proportion of tosses will land flat? This is one of those questions that just kind of no one really thinks about until you actually think about it. And there has to be some kind of an actual proportion or at least proportion as we think about it in stats being the long term outcome of how many Hershey kisses will land flat. And of course, if we were doing this in class, you would actually get 50 Hershey kisses. And after your experiment, they are yours to dispose of as you will. So each group of four is going to select a random sample of Hershey kisses to bring back to the desk. And then you're going to toss all 50 kisses, probably one at a time, to determine what proportion are going to lay flat. Let p hat be the proportion of kisses that land flat. Question one says, what is your point estimate for the true proportion that land flat? And that would just be the proportion of your 50 that land flat. So we've done this in the past and, you know, uh, one of the outcomes happened to be 38%. So let's go with 38% for our video. Next, really importantly, when we're doing these confidence intervals, you've got to take a good uh, listen or a good thought about what is the population and what is the parameter? What is the sample and what is the statistic? Because if you don't know what you're doing, then you're probably not doing it right. The population in this case, we would like to think that the population that we're sampling from is all Hershey kisses. This makes our parameter P, which equals the true proportion of kisses that will land flat. Let's move on now to the sample. And that's going to be our 50 random Hershey kisses. So the sample is always a subset of the population. And for the statistic, that's going to be the proportion of 50 of the 50 kisses. So p hat equals the proportion of 50 kisses, which we got to be 0 0.38. Try to keep those proportions as a decimal. It doesn't really work. Well, no, it does work, but you have to make a couple adjustments if you want to do percentages which we're not going to do in this class. So was this sample a random sample? Well, the kisses were chosen randomly, so yeah, that's a random sample. And this is important because a random sample will allow us to generalize our findings to the whole population, which in this case is all Hershey kisses. Now that's something that we took right out of our chapter four. So if you remember this from chapter four, good on you. This is where it all comes back again. What is the formula for calculating the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for p hat? Back in our binomial chapter, we found that the p hat is going to be approximately, um, well, no, not p hat. Our sigma for p hat is going to be equal to the square root of p hat 1 minus p hat over n. And remember that some conditions had to happen for that to be true. So we had to make sure that because we're not sampling with replacement, we needed to make sure that the 10% uh, rule was met. And then because we're using this, we're going to be using this for a uh, normal distribution, we're going to have to meet large counts as well. But right now, let's just focus on how about this formula for the standard deviation. And this is only true if our sampling without replacement is close enough to sampling with replacement. So the 10% condition has to be met. 
So sometimes it's okay to write something like 50 is less than 10% of all Hershey Kisses, since it's known that Hershey Kisses have been under manufacture for quite a while. And, you know, there's probably more than, let's see, 10 times 50 is 500. So there's probably more than 500 Hershey Kisses at your local supermarket right now. So the 10% condition is may, met. Just make sure that you write down something that says it is met. So this condition is met. So we don't know the value of P exactly. And that's the whole point of doing this confidence interval is to estimate that value of P. So we're going to use P hat instead to, in, our, in our standard deviation, which means I got that standard deviation formula kind of wrong. Really, that standard deviation formula should come with P's instead of P hats. So we're saying sigma p hat is exactly equal to root p 1 minus p over n. And that's approximately equal to root p hat 1 minus p hat over n. Next, we're going to substitute the values. And then we're going to calculate. So our sigma p hat is 0 0.0686. Don't forget that that number is also sometimes called standard error, uh, denoted with SE subscript P hat, which is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Next here is something we've alluded to. Would it be appropriate to use a normal distribution to model the sampling distribution of P hat? The appropriate way to justify the use of a normal distribution for p hat is with large counts. So for large counts, we take a look at np and n1 minus p. But there's a problem because we don't actually have p. So for our purposes, we're going to approximate p with p hat in our formulas. Looking at that first uh, large count condition, we get 19. Well, that's greater than or equal to 10. And the second part of the large count condition is 31. And of course, that's also greater than or equal to 10. So on your paper, you should be writing large counts is met because, and then go through all of the calculations. So whether you realize it or not, we just went through all three conditions for a sampling distribution for a proportion. Condition one is a random condition and that ensures that we have a not only do we have a random sample which will allow us to generalize our findings to our population but it also ensures that our statistic in this case p hat is not biased. Condition two is that 10 percent condition and that 10% condition needs to be met so that our standard deviation formula actually works for us. And condition three is a normal condition or the condition that guarantees a normal distribution. And in our case, for p hat, the normal distribution is met when large counts is met. We will go over all three of those conditions one more time when we get to our important ideas. Now, in a normal distribution, 95% of the data lies within, think about it, two standard deviations of the mean. And that two is what we're going to call a critical value. That's going to be the number of standard deviations that gets you your critical or your um, confidence level. So if our confidence level is a 95%, then our critical value is going to be two. Let's take a look at 80%. Now, 80% of the data lies between how many standard deviations? Now, we don't actually know. But if you look at a normal curve, this might help us figure out what that critical value is going to be. So what we're looking for is the z-scores, which kind of mark off where the central area is 80%. The key here is to figure out the area of the tail. So if that central area is 80%, that's going to make each tail area 
10% because 10 plus 80 plus 10 equals 100%. And don't forget that, how did we get that 10%? We took 100% minus 80 and then we divided by 2. 100 divided minus 80%, that's 20%. 20% divided by 2 is 10%. So we got the tail area is equal to 10%. Both of the Z scores that are associated with those 10% tails are going to be the same, just the one on the left is going to be negative and the one on the right is going to be positive. So we have an opportunity to go to our calculator to figure out what that tail percentage is. Rather, we need to find the Z score for the tail area. Over on our calculator, we're going to go with second distribution and inverse norm. Inverse norm is going to give us a z-score. Now the area that we need is that tail area. So you're going to put point 10 there. And if you are in a rush, you could even put point 80 for that 80%, rather 1 minus point 0.80 and then divide that by 2. Mu is 0, standard deviation is 1. So you can just put that entire formula into inverse norm and then push enter. And here is our critical value. Now critical values are always positive. So even though it says negative 1.282, we're going to use uh, positive 1.282. So here is what it looks like completed, negative 1.282, positive 1.282. So there we have it, 80% of the data lies within 1.282 standard deviations of the mean. So if you need to calculate a confidence interval for proportions and your confidence level is 80%, then your critical value is going to be 1.282. Let's do the same thing for 90%. So distribution, inverse norm. This time we're going to change the area to 1 minus 0 0.9 divided by 2. And that gives us 1.645. I think the next one is 95%. So we'll go back here and go to change this to 95%. Oop, that's not going to do it. go 1.96 and then to spare you the monotony I've gone ahead and I've found the 99% uh, critical value is 2.576 you might want to try that on your own coffee break now we're getting somewhere Let's find the margin of error for the 95% confidence interval by multiplying the critical value and the standard deviation that you found. Maybe you didn't notice it, but they just gave you the formula for every margin of error. Every margin of error that we're going to do is going to be critical value multiplied by standard error. In our particular case, this is going to be Z star. Z star is always a critical value that comes from the Z curve, basically what we just found, multiplied by S E P hat. Now our margin of error particularly is 1.96 multiplied by 0 0.0686. All of those numbers we got from previous calculations and that multiplication gives us 0 0.1345. Okay, we're getting there. Find the 95% confidence interval by using the formula point estimate plus or minus margin of error. There it is kind of slipping in that formula when you weren't aware of it, but the parameter is going to be equal to the point estimate plus or minus a margin of error. 
So for us, that means that the parameter p equals 0 0.38 plus or minus 0 0.1345. Doing the addition and subtraction gives us the interval of 0 0.2455 to 0 0.5145. Next, it says here to add our interval to the graph on the board. Sketch the graph below. This one's kind of hard to simulate because we, you know, we only have our one sample. As if we did this in school, we would have everybody's sample in the class to put together. But here's an example of what would happen. You know, we're going to get a bunch of overlap with all of the intervals that everybody calculates. And maybe there's going to be one or two that are not like the rest of them. And we need to find a place to draw a vertical line that uh, intersects with as many of the um, intervals as possible. And that vertical line would be a plausible value for the true proportion. So in this case, this line at 0 0.35 kind of unites all but one. And I don't think you could draw a better line that would uh, kind of get to all of them. So this is a good estimate for the proportion, 0 0.35. Now, I, I kind of want to say this. The, this right here is just kind of for in example purposes to see how these confidence intervals work. Um, in practice, you would only ever really take one confidence interval. And that one confidence interval needs to be your estimate of the true proportion of whatever it is you're measuring. So if we only had one sample, we would say the true proportion of Hershey Kisses would be 38%. That's our best guess. Although our an interval tells us that it could be anywhere between 25% and 51%. If we had the luxury of looking at many samples, then we would adjust that to 35%, since 35% seems to be the number where, or that most of the confidence intervals will touch or contain. Now we've had quite a day so far, so here are the learning targets that we need to hit. And the first one is, if we're going to create a confidence interval for a population proportion, we're going to need to satisfy three conditions. So the first one is either the sample has to be a random sample, or if this was an experiment, then the treatments needed to be randomly assigned. The second one is a 10% condition, which we've talked about quite a bit. Um, and the third one is the large counts condition, which again, we talked about a lot. Now, don't forget that if you don't have a value for P in your large count condition, you're going to be using P hat to estimate uh, the large counts. The second thing we saw was the computation of critical values. So there are three that most people will just memorize right off the bat. And that's the 90% confidence um, critical value, the 95% confidence critical value, and the 99% confidence critical value. All three of these get used pretty frequently. So you might, might want to memorize them so you're not always reaching for your calculator. Um, if you do need to calculate the the critical value for any confidence level, like I'll be on a test and I'll put an 86 confidence level, just so that uh, you you know students will have to compute that uh, rather than relying on their memory. So to do this, you're going to have to do the inverse norm of the tail percentage, which is the same thing as the inverse norm of uh, 0 0.5 times one half times one minus the confidence level. And then finally, the construction of a confidence interval for P, we're going to do um, P is equal to the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. And in the case of P hats, it's going to be P hat plus or minus Z star square root of P hat minus one minus multiplied by one minus P hat over N. 
And that last bit inside the square root, that's what we call the standard error. Let's check our understanding with uh, this problem. Sleep Awareness Week begins in the spring with the release of the National Sleep Foundation's annual poll of U.S. sleep habits and ends at the beginning of daylight savings time, when most people lose an hour of sleep. In the Foundation's random sample of 1,029 U.S. adults, 48% reported that they often or always get enough sleep during the last seven nights. How about that parameter of interest? So it seems like we're trying to measure the proportion of adults who often or always get enough sleep. Number two says to check the conditions for constructing a confidence interval for P is met. The first condition is the random condition. So did this come from a random sample or a random assignment of treatments? For this part, I like to look at the question and try to quote the relevant part of the question which answers this condition. So for me, number one, the perfect response would be the, ran the foundation took a quote random sample. The second condition is a 10% condition. You'll notice that the question indicates that the sample is uh, 1,029 US adults. And so what you would say is that it is reasonable that 1,029 is less than 10% of all US adults. Now most of the time this is going to be uh, qualified pretty quickly because the population is a, you know, not an unknown thing. The correct normal condition for P, for population proportion, is large counts. So I almost always will make a habit of just writing large counts is satisfied because, and then start to show those calculations. So NP is 0 0.48 multiplied by 1029, which gives us 493.92, which is greater than or equal to 10. Don't worry if that comes out as a decimal, it's not a big deal. It just needs to be greater than 10. And the second part is N multiplied by 1 minus P is 535.08, which is greater than or equal to 10. For me, I'm pretty much always going to just subtract NP from the sample size. So in order to get that 535.08, what I actually did was a subtraction problem, 1029 minus 493.92. Question three says to find the critical value for the 98% confidence interval and then calculate the interval. On your paper, since we're doing so many other things here, it's going to be okay for you to write z star equals inverse norm, tail equals 0 0.5, parenthesis 1 minus 0 0.98. That's going to be enough. Again, uh, under no other circumstances, you probably would be drawing a normal curve and using the two equations. But in this case, we're doing so much already, so it's it's going to be okay. If we put all of that in our calculator, ooh, I see a mistake. That should have been 0 0.98. There we go. If we put it in our calculator and we push enter, we get a z-score of 2.326. Remember, the critical value is always positive. So even if you see that negative, you can just ignore it. 2.326. The next thing to calculate is our margin of error. So first write the formula, then substitute the numbers, and then write the answer. You're going to find that that process of write the general formula, then substitute the numbers, and then find the answer, that's going to be something that's going to carry us through a lot of AP stats from here on out as well. Here's another perfect example. Any st any um, Parameter, in this case P, is equal to a point estimate plus a margin of error. That's the general formula. 
And then the specific formula is p hat plus or minus z star root p hat 1 minus p hat over n. Substitute all of the numbers. And then make your calculation. So p is, is equal to 0 0.42 plus or minus is 0 0.0843. Lastly, it says to interpret this interval in context. This comes right out of our sentence frames. So let's pull up the sentence frame for a confidence interval. Here's the appropriate sentence frame. And let's start putting in numbers. We are 98% confident that the interval from 0 0.3357 to 0 0.5043 captures the true proportion of got enough sleep, often or always got enough sleep. We are 98% confident that the interval from 0 0.3357 to 0 0.5043 captures the true proportion of U.S. adults who report that often that they often or always got enough sleep. And looking good. So that was it for today. It was kind of a long one for AP Stats. Um, but these skills are going to be things that you're going to reuse over and over again in the next few chapters. So, you know, really take the time to master what's what is happening here and all of the, the little nuances that we did so with that said i'll see you guys later and have a great day